Hi there. In this video, we're going to take a look at some applications of income elasticity of demand. Well, income elasticity measures the relationship between a change in quantity demanded for a particular product and a change in people's real incomes. And the formula is percentage change in quantity demanded for X divided by the percentage change in real income. Now, with income elasticity, we make a distinction between normal and inferior products and between normal luxuries and normal necessities. So all normal goods have a positive income elasticity, or YED for short. With luxury goods, the income elasticity is strongly positive. The coefficient is greater than plus one. For example, a 10% rise in income might lead to a 20% increase in quantity demanded, giving plus two. With necessities, the income elasticity is between zero and plus one. For example, a 20% rise in income leads only to a 5% increase in demand. Inferior goods have a negative income elasticity of demand. They're known as counter-cyclical cyclical goods. What that means is that the products whose demand goes down when the economy is growing tends to go up in an economic downturn or recession. So normal goods, why it is greater than zero for normal necessities, the income elasticity is greater than zero, but less than one. Think your, your, your milk, your vegetables, your fruit in the supermarkets, your cereals, for example. Whereas luxuries have a higher positive cross-price elasticity of greater than one. However, what is considered a necessity in a luxury must be contextual. It depends on the economic circumstances, the financial circumstances of the people involved. Now, inferior goods are what we're going to focus on in this video. So if following a, an increase in real income, less of the product is bought, then we have an inferior good. They have a negative income elasticity of demand. During periods of recession, uh, when incomes are falling, then the market demand for inferior goods can go up. Now, there's no hard and fast rules as to what counts as inferior goods, but typically private label uh, economy brands of food in supermarkets, urban bus transport, cigarettes, economy class travel, for example, on rail or bus, own label cereals and essential basic products you often see in the aisles of the supermarkets. They would be they would be typically counted by economists, depending on the data, as inferior goods. Now, knowledge of this helps firms predict the effect of changes in the macroeconomic cycle on their sales, their revenue and ultimately their profits. Luxury products with a high YD of more than plus one, well, they tend to see greater sales volatility over a business cycle than necessities where demand is more predictable, more stable from year to year. It's typically important for businesses to have a diversified product range. Supermarkets have that from basic economy products to uh, you know uh, premium, higher value products. And those higher value added products increase profit margins because they have a high income elasticity of demand and typically a low co uh, coefficient of price elasticity. Interestingly, in the UK in recent times, wages have been going up, as this chart shows, as the growth of uh, nominal pay, including bonuses, never less than 4%. But if we take off the effects of inflation, this is what we see happening. And from the spring of 2022, all the way through really to the summer of 2023, there was a steep uh, and persistent fall in real wages for millions of people. This became known and is still known as the cost of living crisis. What happened is that real wages were falling. Taxes were also going up, so real disposable incomes took a big hit. Now, many people saw their real disposable incomes go down and they cut back. They tried to find ways of cutting back on luxuries and, and trying to switch where they could to cheaper alternatives. And this is interesting from an income elasticity point of view because it creates winners and losers in the business world. Some of the winners included businesses such as discount supermarkets, fast food chains, other budget end retailers, and things like repair and second hand markets, a Depop, Vinted, Facebook Marketplace, so on and so forth. Interestingly, the rise of Aldi and Little perhaps has been accelerated by uh, the cost of living crisis. Many people, not all, but many people have traded down from premium supermarkets to discount retailers or they've mixed up their shopping. They might have one big shop at Aldi per week and maybe a little bit of partial shopping elsewhere. And Aldi and Little both saw record market share gains, as we'll see, during 2022 to 24. 
In fact, in 23, Aldi became the fourth largest supermarket in the UK, overtaking Morrison's. Now, some of that was because of this income elasticity of demand effect, people switching their spending, but sales growth also amplified by rapid expansion in the number of stores. So this chart is really interesting. It shows Lidl's year-on-year -year sales growth, clearly affected uh, by lockdown and the pandemic in 2020-21. But you can see then during the cost of living crisis, year-on-year -year sales growth uh, rose above 25% at one stage. Now it's come down, but it's still growing at close to 10% a year. And you can see that Lidl and Aldi have seen their market share in the UK grocery market continue to climb higher. Largely, it has to be said, at the expense of Asda and also Morrison's. And as you can see, Aldi overtook Morrison's in 2023, and that gap is widening. Indeed, Lidl is likely to overtake uh, Morrison's in the near future. Other businesses that did well, fast food chains, consumers cutting back, eating out less perhaps, but still wanting that affordable convenience. So McDonald's and Greggs in particular has seen very strong footfall, even as inflation has hit food prices. There's nearly always a queue outside Greggs in my local town, for example. And the budget retailers, Poundland obviously, but B&M. And these stores tend to benefit when people seek low prices on basic items, you know, toiletries, washing powder, and the food basics. Indeed, in the last two years, B&M has reported much higher profits and, as we'll see, has expanded store numbers across the UK. So this is a really interesting business to quote in an exam. The number of B&M stores has risen from uh, 373 just over a decade ago to 741, more than doubling in size, essentially. And their revenues have gone up likewise. Obviously, it took a dip in 2022, don't know why, but it did. But you can see that their revenues have grown very strongly uh, from 1.5 billion in 2015 to just under 4.5 billion in 2024. And these two charts, I think, show the scale and the, the, the steep increase, the rapid growth of BMM, b &M as a discount retailer. So think Greg's, think Aldi, think Little, think b &M, think Poundland. Lots of good examples of income elasticity of demand in the retail sector. Thanks for joining in.